the Nixon Foundation look back at the events of 50 years ago, the tragedy at Kent State, the loss of four lives, the wounding of nine others, altering forever American history and the history of that uh, group of young guardsmen, that group of students, those families impacted by that. My guest is James Rosen, author of The Strong Man. You know him from Sinclair Broadcasting. He's been on television for years. He's an eminent historian, and he knows these events very well. James Rosen, in the immediate aftermath of the shooting, what happened to President Nixon? What happened to John Mitchell? What was their immediate reaction? You mentioned that they sent off a statement that was uh, considered calculating cold. Yeah, yeah, the White House issued a statement through the press secretary, uh, in essence saying that any time dissent turns to violence, it invites tragedy. Um, and frankly, um, there was a more hardcore militant group roving among the population at Kent State campus that day than President Nixon and, and Attorney General Mitchell could even have recognized or known at that time, according to, again, to the uh, previously unpublished FBI documents that my research turned up. Uh, it's also important to note that there was a subsequent event at Jackson State University, uh, where law enforcement, I believe, killed a number of uh, African-American protesters um, at a predominantly African-American uh, institution of higher learning, Jackson State. And the killings at Jackson State have always been eclipsed and overshadowed by the killings at Kent State. And that's been a point of contention for uh, historians of uh, African American, uh, the African American experience in this country. Um, but it, it, it's an important event, Jackson State, because it shows, without regard to color necessarily, that, um, that there was a convulsion overtaking this country at that time. Uh, and we never like to delve too deeply into the counterfactual, the what ifs of history. But it's entirely plausible that, that kind, those kinds of confrontations uh, would have ultimately arisen even if President Nixon hadn't announced an incursion into Cambodia, simply by virtue of what we can tell looking back on the evolution of the protest movement in this country and how it sort of amped up and amped up and amped up and escalated and escalated. It's almost in retrospect as if some kind of fatal confrontation was, was um, foreordained. You mentioned, James, in part two, that this had the effect of uh, a crescendo to a conclusion for the anti-war movement. That, is it fair to say everybody drew back after blood was shed? In essence, not everyone drew back. Uh, there was a dedicated, revolutionary, hardcore domestic terrorist presence in this country well into the 1980s. Um, as evidenced by the 1981 Brinks truck episode in uh, upstate New York. Um, the, the fugitives who went underground, targeted by Nixon and Mitchell and J. Edgar Hoover, the director of the FBI at the time, um, stayed underground, some of them for years, and they were still publishing manifestos as late as 1974, uh, when the fervor from the anti-war movement had largely, had largely departed. Um, but um, in, by and large, yes, people realized that they didn't want to be shot on campuses for uh, hurling rocks and, and, and getting in the face of guardsmen or police or what have you. Uh, it's almost as if they all took to heart uh, John Lennon's uh, admonition from the bed-in campaign that he, that he launched with Yoko Ono after their marriage in early 1969, where they, did, they staged bed-ins for peace. And, uh, and the author of Revolution, the song Revolution, in essence said, I'd rather protest by staying in bed. James Rosen, after the shootings, after the Newsweek cover, after the country absorbed this blow, what happened to the anti-war movement? Did it dissipate? Did it grow for a time? And because Nixon goes on to a massive re-election, announces peace in our time, peace is at hand, a deal with China. This is May of 1970. By uh, the early 1972, he's on the Great Wall of China. Clearly, the Kent State killing, which would today result in, one would imagine, in a hemorrhaging of events and ink did not change history that much. There was one final last gasp of the uh, hardcore anti-war left after Kent State. Again, Kent State was May 4, 1970, and that was May Day 1971. Again, a, 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 an extraordinary event in which John Mitchell played a central role. Uh, the, the surviving remnants of the uh, violent anti-war movement uh, members, former members of the Chicago Seven, including Rennie Davis, for example, whom I interviewed for The Strong Man, um, staged one last event designed to use um, violence and um, mass protest 
to shut down what they called at that time the war machine. The idea of the protest of May Day, 1971, May 1, 1971, coincidentally the uh, first day of broadcast operations for NPR, yeah. which did a fine job of covering the events that day and whose transcripts I relied on for my research. Um, May 1, 1971 was an effort to shut down the war machine by physically swarming the various points of egress and, and uh, ingress uh, from Northern Virginia and Maryland into Washington, D.C., with the idea being that if enough human bodies were laid across the key bridge, the Memorial Bridge, and other points through which commuters and civil servants and bureaucrats travel to, to get into Washington, D.C., that that would shut down the various departments and cabinet agencies and other elements of, quote-unquote, the establishment that, that prosecuted the war. Um, and uh, there was, in fact, um, a very crazy scene on the streets of Washington, D.C. on May 1, 1971, and photographs of that time show troops deployed in Georgetown with rifles and uh, jeeps, um, and what Attorney General Mitchell decided to do was arrest everyone in sight, uh, working in tandem, of course, with the Metropolitan Police and, uh, and the National Guard and other units, and on May 1 to May 2, 1971, more than 7,000 people were arrested and most of them placed into RFK Stadium in Washington, D.C. And again, the litigation over this went on for about 10 years afterwards, with the arrests ultimately declared constitutional. But it marked, and it still remains to this day, the largest tally of arrests on a single day in American history. And it did not shut down the war machine. And in fact, the, uh, the attendance rates for bureaucrats in various key agencies at the time, federal agencies, was actually up on that day, not down. So James Rosen, to sum up, was it any of it worth it? Nixon was bent on a path. Uh, the president was aiming to end the war with dignity. He did, and the views of many, including my favorite author on this subject, Richard Botkin in Ride the Thunder, successfully conclude the military campaign only to have Watergate rob him of that successful piece. He opened the, the door to China, which may or may not have been a good thing 50 years later. But the, the anti-war movement that had such a high cost 50 years ago on May 4th, was it worth it? Did it achieve anything at all? There are some aging members of the revolutionary left still alive today who will argue passionately, with the same passion they always demonstrate, that they brought the war machine to its knees and it was their protests and their movement that ultimately brought an end to an immoral war in Southeast Asia. Other scholars would say, in fact, probably your movement and your actions had the effect of lengthening the war. Um, I think that um, another key event that happened right after May Day 1971, which belongs properly to the anti-war movement, is the publication by the New York Times in June 1971 of the Pentagon Papers, uh, a series of 7,000 classified pages of documents, Defense Department documents, White House documents, State Department documents, tracing America's deepening involvement in Vietnam since the Eisenhower era. And they were leaked to the New York Times by a disaffected Pentagon staffer and a former Marine named Daniel Ellsberg, who had joined the anti-war movement. And it was President Nixon's response to the publication of the Pentagon Papers, which vastly depicted the deceptions of previous Democratic administrations under John F. Kennedy and Lyndon Johnson, and had very little to do with President Nixon's own administration. Nonetheless, it was Nixon's response to the publication of those papers. Kissinger convinced Nixon that, again, to protect American power and prestige and alliances, a demonstration needed to be made by the Nixon White House that they wouldn't tolerate the publishing of whole filing cabinets of documents in the New York Times. And so Attorney General Mitchell was enjoined to try to uh, use the courts to uh, end the publication of the Pentagon Papers and went all the way to the Supreme Court in record time. Uh, and a divided court upheld the right of New York Times to continue publishing the Pentagon Papers. Because J. Edgar Hoover, the director of the FBI, was kind of sluggish in his pursuit of the, uh, the identity of who leaked the Pentagon Papers, President Nixon decided to form his own SIU in the White House, Special Investigations Unit, later became known by the moniker of the Plumbers for their efforts to plug news leaks. And the Plumbers did some legitimate national security work that's unheralded and very important still today. I wish you and I could do a separate program about the so-called Maura Radford affair. but. Um, the plumbers also conducted a break-in into the office of Daniel Ellsberg's psychiatrist that was illegal, and the break-in and wiretapping at the Democratic National Committee headquarters 
at the Watergate complex. I, I believe it, it's pretty obvious, and we will at the library begin commemorating Watergate when that break-in occurs, because that is the beginning of the Watergate crisis that would end the Nixon presidency. But when you ask me, did the did the anti-war movement achieve anything? The debate can rage on between uh, aging hippies and, and uh, v Vietnam historians as to whether they caused the war to be shortened or lengthened. But it's indisputable that Nixon's response to the efforts of one prominent member of the anti-war left, Daniel Ellsberg, led him down a path that ultimately brought him ruin. That's absolutely indisputable. Uh, James Rosen, I want to thank you for your past contributions to keep the memory of everything, everything that happened on May 4th, especially the four dead, especially the nine wounded, especially the National Guard, but just the entire completeness of that proposition. I hope you publish again on that anniversary. I hope you've enjoyed our conversation. Friends of the Nixon Foundation and listeners to the Hugh Hewitt Show, I wish this will be excerpted. Uh, it's a, a, a sad, regrettable, awful day in American history, but one that ought not to pass unnoticed. James Rosen, thank you for joining me. Thank you, Hugh.